Yvette, I got to thank you for coming. I'm so excited to be here. That's it's fantastic to see you. Seriously. Uh, I, I am. Can I say you're my favorite? Well, you're my favorite. Okay. That's, right. that's a mutual favorite I'm kind just, of thing. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, too. <laughs> Do you have any idea how much you inspire people? Are you aware of that? Uh, not really. Not to really. To some extent. I, yes. Well, I've met um, young girls, particularly in the Caribbean, that would come up to me and say, I want to be a journalist or I want to be a publicist because that was the road you took. And I just remember when I was home, I didn't even know what a publicist was. And so that's, 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 that's the kind of thing that makes you cry, you know, because I just sort of, I just go to work and try to feed my family and, <laughs> try to and do, your best. Do, do the best job I could mm -hmm. and make sure the money's in the bank at the end of the month for the mortgage. But I, I think that um, <laughs> you, have to be, you have to be aware after a number of years that there are people that are watching. And what does that mean to you when you hear that, when people come up to you and they're, you know, they're telling you your whole life story? They know where you were back yeah. then, Beyonce, Destiny's. They can go through the whole list. They know more about it than I do sometimes. <laughs> but what, is that, what does that mean to you? Well, it means everything. I mean, honestly, it means everything. It, it means that um, what I do matters, not just that I am executing a plan for a client, but that something in my work or sometimes even in the client's work resonate with them. And um, they're able to see images uh, of themselves that they didn't think was possible. And I always say that we cannot all be Beyonce. We don't all have that incredible talent. But it's nice for young people, particularly young women and young women of color, to see that you could still have a successful career, even if you're not the one picking up the microphone. And then also that in the execution of that whole plan, there are lots of people behind. That's right. You're in all the pictures, by the way. I, I know, and I tried to duck. <laughs> You I Google try Beyonce. To duck. I try to talk. Google Beyonce, and you're in the pictures. And the faces I make, my children always, um, <laughs> whenever there's a live red carpet, I get texts from my girls, Mika and Milan, and they will text me and say, fix your face, mommy, <laughs> because they said that I get really protective and I put on my protective face sure. when Beyonce gets on the carpet. But when I was working John Legend and Beyonce together, they would always say to me, you look so happy with John. And I think it's because that when I started working with John Legend, who I don't represent anymore, we've remained friends, but when I started working with him, he was already an adult. And when uh -huh. I started working with Beyonce and all of the ladies of Destiny's Child, they were 14 year old girls and I had that protective so you're face like your on. Mom. Yeah, and it <laughs> stayed, you know, because I was like, Miss Tina and Matthew Knowles, trust me to do the right thing and I have to do the right thing and that has never left me. Even a few weeks ago on um, the carpet for the Lion King premiere in Los Angeles, I had to kick myself because I felt my face tensing up. And you I was all like, serious? Yeah. Like what are you protecting them from? What's going on? I think These in the very beginning. vultures in the media? Well, there are vultures, but yeah. I think the, now that they're grown, they can handle that. But I feel like from the be the very beginning, um, I just took very seriously the trust that their parents um, put in me. And I wanted to always do the right thing. And I also, I disdain people screaming at people on the red carpet. <laughs> so I think that's where the protection came up because people would start screaming and they would not say, Destiny's child, they were saying, Beyonce, Latavia! Yeah, they were like screaming at them and I would slightly turn around. Rude. Just slightly rude. Mm. And I would turn around with this Caribbean woman's look like, if you even yell at them one more time, you know? And it just kind of <laughs> stayed with me. And so, and so I have to get better. This, that face is horrible. I have to get better. It's a good that. thing your kids are on the case, so they're watching. Oh, they're all the time. Uh, all the time. Uh, yes. Speaking yes. of Destiny's Child. Yeah. I'm reading that there's a big 2020 worldwide tour. I'm reading it too. You're Honestly, reading it? Honestly, Maurice, I was like, Come on. what is everybody talking you about? You can't confirm this? No, no, because I, I can't confirm it because it's not true. You Seriously? No, seriously. It's not true? It's I not mean, happening? It's it's not happening. It might at, not happen? At least, well, I, I don't know if it's never, never, never going to happen, but I'm saying the news that came out the last couple of days, I, I had just gotten back from my vacation and it was like, 
did something happen that I don't know about? No, it's not true. But really? I love that. So can, can I call time out here? <laughs> because you are famous for keeping secrets. I do. You I keep do. them from your husband. I do. When it comes to work. Oh, of I course. don't know about anything else. No, That's I tell him everything business. personal. But right. uh, when it comes to work, he knows nothing. Right. But, yeah. but there was an album that came out that nobody knew about. Not even my husband. Mysteriously. Yeah. Because you kept it secret. Of course. So is this that kind of thing? No, no, Are no. Are you just telling me, look, that ain't happening no, and no, it's going to no, happen? No, no, no. Really? If we, because uh, for Destiny's Child, I think it's a nostalgic thing for so many people, including myself. 20 years. Right. And it's it's such a good time uh, in the world, in music. There was just a, an, a, a magical moment, and I know everybody wants that. The mm -hmm. good thing is that the ladies are great friends. And they do magical things together. We saw that on Coachella. the Super Bowl. We saw Coachella. Right. So I'm not, I, I'm a fan too. I'm going, hurry up, hurry up. But just the announcement that came out or wherever that came from, this is what I'm going to say, Maurice. When the announcement contact on the press release says Yvette Noel Shore or Matthew Knowles, you're going to know it's true. Other than that, other than that, it's not happening. It's, it's it's everybody wanting something very special, and trust me, I want it too. And I'm thinking we're gonna break some news here. <laughs> it's not happening. No, not no. today. But it doesn't that's mean so, that it's never gonna happen. That's so disappointing. I have nothing else. I have no further questions. We're done. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna wrap it Sorry, up right ladies. here. Sorry, oh ladies. my gosh. You know, don't forget. You know, there there are the fans of Destiny's Child. Yes. Four, and then there are the fans of Destiny's Child three. Yes. Right. And so I think. Yes honestly and professionally for that to happen i think there's a lot of schedules to put together because i really believe that all the fans want to see all the versions of True. destiny's child yeah True. so it's going to take a minute because now now we're also talking about women not young young girls anymore we're uh. talking about women with lives who are moms and wives and you know so it, it takes it's going to take a minute but uh I'm the number one fan of Destiny's Child, and I'm pushing too. So when it happens, you'll be deeply involved in the logistics of it, or simply telling the world? I'll probably just be telling the world. <laughs> I think I'll just be telling the world. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. if you were to tell, you talked about this girl from Grenada. Yeah. If you were to tell this girl from Grenada that you would be hanging out with the biggest superstar in the world, the biggest stars in the world, doing what you do, what, what would you, you know, what what would you tell that child? I, I would have never told her that. I would not even even know how to dream that wide. You know, dreaming big is easy for Caribbean people. That's what we do. We believe that there's a bigger world out there, and we believe that we need to go and conquer that world and come back and make our islands better. But to dream wide is what I call dreaming out of your mind, like imagining things that could never happen. So I would have never thought my life would be what it is and I would never never think back then that the catalyst mm. for my journeys around the world would be this young girl that was part of this amazing group from a city that I never heard of you know I mean when I first came to Houston? America yeah Houston, never was, heard of Houston no but I'm saying Houston was not the city that anybody talked about for, for Texas when I was in Grenada not on your radar we talked about Dallas, you know, but right. Houston, I was like, Houston? So to then learn about Houston and then to find out that that's where it was the nucleus for Destiny's Child, I had all the wrong ideas. I thought Houston was going to look like Dallas. I thought it was going to remind me of the old Dallas show. Right. And I got to Houston and I was like, wow, this is a really cosmopolitan <laughs> city and uh, no cowboys running around, you know. Uh, for me to see anyhow there and I was like okay get that out of your head like this is a really different place and when I met them uh four of them at that time I just thought wow there's so much talent here I'll tell you the story I was staying in a hotel a beautiful hotel I can't remember the name and I invited them to come to the hotel so I can sit and talk to them and just try to get to know them I had come from Blackbeat magazine before right. I went to Sony and I had my my journalistic integrity here like right, I need right, to right. know everything and uh, sat down to sort of do an interview with them to 
find out what each girl brought to the table because when I was at Black Beat and we were covering uh, like New Edition and New Kids on the Block, what was important to the fans was to know little things about each one. So that's what I wanted to do. And I sat with them and they sang Amazing Grace to really? me. Really? A cappella? Yeah. On a couch? Just sitting here like this? Just sitting. Actually, we were on the floor. We just sat on the floor in the sat hotel on the floor. room. Yeah. Okay. Sat on the floor. I ordered chocolate covered strawberries, <laughs> and these four young ladies sang, and I said, wow. Okay, and in Are that- Are you just saying that in retrospect, or is it at the no, moment no, you really were blown moment, away? No, no, at that moment, I said this is, in fact, um, Beyonce in particular, uh, she still does it today, she looks you deep in your eyes when she's talking to you. Like, this, this is who matters, that person in front of me. And she has also perfected how to make an audience member in a stadium of 80,000 people feel that same connection. Really? And I felt it then, and I remember after that first meeting, calling Miss Tina, now Miss Tina knows her Lawson's, mom. her mom, and saying to her, your daughter, she was 14, your daughter looks me right in the eye. Where does that come from? And she said, that's something that we have taught our children, wow. that it's very important, people matter, and you need to be respectful and pay attention. Right. And she still does that. There's, there's so much to your story. I, I could go a million different ways. But <laughs> let, me, let me just kind of go with the present and we'll go back to the past, okay. right? The present, what's your day-to-day -day like right now? I know right now you ran in here, you it's gotta run out, you busy. gotta call. <laughs> you just got off a plane from Italy. Yeah. You're posting pictures about this fabulous time. What is yes. your, what's your day-to-day? -day? What, what is the job? People say publicist, what do you, what do, you do? What does that uh, mean? What my does that day mean? is really, really full, and it's very, um, it's never the same thing. It's never the same thing. So let me explain that when I worked with Destiny's Child and Mariah and John, I worked for, for Sony Music, Columbia Records. Right. I was a regular publicist, then I became the head of the department, and then I became a senior VP. Now I co founded my own company. Mm -hmm. So b besides Beyonce and Chloe and Halle, I have clients that have nothing to do with Sony Music and nothing to do with Parkwood Entertainment, which is Beyonce's company. So I have many, many hats and many, many flip-flops to run around the city with different people at different times. So to handle their publicity. To handle their publicity. Their media appearances and etc. Media appearances, you know, certain events, uh, their philanthropic work, um, particularly with Beyonce, we do... Um, uh, be good, but I also do some work with care. I do that with Michelle Williams. So mm -hmm. I, I never quite know where my day is going to take me, even though I'm a, I'm a person who always has pen and paper. I write everything down. I do not trust that I will remember everything. So I I'm anal. I write in black and I cross out in red. Really? Yes. And I, like I that. that's how I that's how I stay on top of paying attention to all of my clients. Details. One of the things that I do uh, deliberately is that I am not trying to have the biggest PR firm in the world. I want to keep my firm a boutique firm because I want to be there for the artists. I want to pay attention to them. I have people who work for me and uh, I have to make sure that those clients are really comfortable with that person. A lot of them I stole from Sony <laughs> from back in the day. Wow. Um, but uh, but it's, what are the it's needs? never the same. It's never the same. A different client wants different things. You what know? are the needs? What do they need? Do um, they call you, they just need an ear? Do they need to cry? Do they need to advise? All of the above. Yeah. Um, so I've become a little bit of a auntie <laughs> to everybody. Uh -huh. So apart from calling the outlets and placing st the stories usually uh, connected with an album release, a movie release, mm -hmm. an event, uh, a water crisis we're doing in East Africa, whatever it is. Um, apart from that, I'm also here to say that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Strategy. Do that. Yeah, right. yeah, to strategize. Um, some of my clients have become very personal with uh, in terms of being in their lives for a long time. So we have really deep conversations about what the heck is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, can we, how can we change that? How could, we, how could we inform young people who look like us mm -hmm. uh, 
to come into their power and be it voting, be it just using your voice, be it standing up for what you believe in, saying no and really meaning no, saying yes and going ahead with it, knowing that nothing comes to you without hard work. So I'm always, I'm always in those conversations with my clients, uh, whether it's us talking or, or us on um, texting or, but. Right. You even put out fires too, right? I put out a lot of fires. There and was I, one I stop people from making a fool of themselves. True, <laughs> true. You know? There was the one where Beyonce was sitting courtside. Yes. At the, what was it, the Warriors game. Yep. And the owner of the Warriors, his wife, is reaching over to communicate with Jay-Z and Beyonce sitting right there. Yeah, literally to ask, ask if they wanted lemon. A, in, in their drink, water. Right? <laughs> yeah. And Beyonce has an expression on her face that the world interprets to mean that she's telling this woman to stay away from her man. Right. right? Which and is so the so internet untrue. goes nuts. So people think they're seeing something and then you step in. I had to. What did you have to say? Well, you know, it's one thing for you to be a super fan and say, um, I don't like the way I, I, I'm assuming you disrespected somebody I love. And, you know, and then after about 24 hours, that goes away. But this thing kept going and going and going and <laughs> going. And then it became, well, we don't know who this woman is. We don't like her. And we're going to not only threaten her life, we're going to encourage her to take her own life. But it let's, let's it think just about became this. crazy. This is the wife of the owner. Who invited uh, this the Carters. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I made a decision as a human being first, uh, as a publicist second. This was really not how, that's not how we roll at all. Right. And if you're doing it in the name of my client, that is not how she rolls. And so I was like, okay, 24 hours, 48 hours? 72. Oh, 72? <laughs> We're close to 96? Oh, no, no, no. So you we, had to say something. Yeah, I had to say What'd something. You, say? you know, I, I am always a mom first, so I always lead with love. And I acknowledge their love for her. And I acknowledge that we love them. Uh, not just her, but our entire camp. Right. You, we uh, we love the Beehive. They're they're the most loyal fans. Right. However, but I also <laughs> I also had to scold them in true Caribbean woman fashion that you cannot mix love and hate. Right. It's oil and water. Right. That doesn't work. So and people need to step back. You cannot do it in her name. Yeah. You need to step back. Yeah. And uh, a few of them came for me. That's crazy. And I did not turn off. My comments. Right. I didn't. I didn't cower. I didn't hide. I just posted, and I moved on. I had to cook dinner that <laughs> night. I had laundry to do. <laughs> I had to spend the day with my grandchild. Like I had things to do. This is what needed to be done. Right. And I think, truthfully, I'm the only one that could have done it because I don't. I don't think that they would have listened to anybody else. Honestly. You know, even though some of them cursed me out, I just feel like it needed to be said. Uh, only because I think I have, I have that history. Right. And you also have superior people skills. Oh. You really do. I watch I you. I'm just that. listening to you, and, and only the, the few minutes that we've been chatting, I'm like, wow. Because you diffuse something very, very ridiculous, but it could have gotten serious. It could have gotten very right? serious. But that's but yeah. but to have these superior people skills is what has you where you are. Well, thank you to Papa from Grenada. I'm just saying, <laughs> right? That's and where it, and that's it. where it starts. Yeah, that's. I where wanted it to talk about that. Yeah. The, the beginnings in Grenada. Mm -hmm. Your your mom struggled with mental illness. Struggled, struggled. Right? Yeah. And so your grandfather, and your dad, right? Yep. Spent most of the time raising you. Yeah. And and from them you learned. A lot. So much. Right. I, I give my grandfather so much credit for being a feminist. And I say that everywhere I go. He was the first feminist I've ever met. Meaning what? He just believed that whatever my brothers could do, I should do it too. And at least I should attempt to. So when I was growing up, women were driven. Your husband got in the front. I never saw my grandmother in the front of the car. Sat in the back? She sat in the back. She was driven. Really? My uncle 
or, or some other male figure went in the front with my grandfather. But this my is the 70s. This was, well, I, I was born in 61. So okay. like, I guess 69, 60, you know, 70, like I. The wife sitting I, in the back. No, but, it, it, but, but she was proud to. Okay. She had her hat on. She was being chauffeured. She was being chauffeured. Okay. It wasn't that it's she, not that you know. Bad. Yeah, and <laughs> so, but my it. grandfather with me said, I think you need to know how to drive. Mm. I think you, because you are a smart young lady, you know, and he really pushed me. I remember him bringing me into his little shop. Of course, I thought it was a supermarket, but when you go back home and you visit, you realize that it's really a bodega. <laughs> <laughs> But it was like the biggest shop I've ever seen, and I grew up in that shop, and I remember him lifting me up on the counter of the shop and collecting all of the sweet drinks bottles, like the Coca-Cola bottles mm -hmm. and stuff, the tops of it, and making a diagram on the counter for me to learn how to count because we didn't have a cash register. Uh -huh. And when people came to the store, they came with a list, and we filled the list. So next to the item, you had to put the cost of the item. And at the end of filling a list of 30 things, you had to now count one column at a time without a cash register. Wow. So he had to teach me to count seven and eight and nine and two and four and six and seven and get the right number. With bottle it. caps. Yeah. Like an abacus. Yeah, right? exactly. Wow. Exactly. So he, he just really, really pushed me. Uh, there was a time that... My grandfather gave me a, a brown paper bag and put me on the bus and sent me down to the market and told me to give it to the to Mr. Bola who what was, was in the um, bag? it was money. Cash. Yeah. I never opened it until Mr. Bola did. He trusted you. He trusted me. It was to buy the groceries for our store, right. for our village. I was, whoa, I'm buying food for the entire village. This is great. Because at the time my grandfather was one of three merchants that had stores that especially the older people didn't have to go all the way to the market they could so he wanted to bring everything from the town to them and I was a part mm. of all those conversations mm. I just when people believe in you you have to work hard because right. it would have been detrimental for me to think about disappointing my grandfather wow. what did you learn about people from him about dealing with people be patient and reach them where they are. Ah, did he say that or did no. he do it by example? By example. You just saw it? I just saw it. You figured it out? He, he, he was a very proud man, had his store, had his farm where he picked bananas, green, green bananas <laughs> for shipping to England, right. cocoa and nutmeg. He could have lived on that. He paid all our school fees on that. But yet still on Thursdays, he put on a white shirt, the sort of Cuban shirt. We call them shirt jacks. They have a pocket here, a pocket here, a pocket here, a pocket here. Mm -hmm. Put on some black pants, some shades, spruced up his car, put the trucks in the garage, used his car, went down to the airport and picked up the tourists to give them an island tour. Really? Because it was very important to him that they understood what Grenada was, that it wasn't just beaches, that it was people like him up in the mountains that kept the economy going. I watched all of that. Wow. So this I was a side job? It was a side job. He had right. a side job, even though he was a well, you know, he was a man that was doing well mm -hmm. from his farm and from his shop. Mm -hmm. But he had a side job because the history of Grenada was important to him to tell. He was a talker kind of took a little bit of that from him too. You're uh, your grandfather's he girl. He would just tell, yeah, I, um, I loved him. I yeah. loved him and he was not um, a demonstrator of love. He wasn't gonna hug you and mess up your hair and stuff like that. He just loved you mm. and he did all the things he had to do for you. And as I got older, I realized Yes, my grandfather loved us, but he loved his daughter, my mother, even more. Mm. And he wanted to step in mm. and do for us what she was incapable of doing. And our dad was there, but our dad now had to do the extra work as the, as the single parent, really, uh, while my mom was uh, nursing what at the time we didn't know what, what it was, but it, uh, it was uh, mental illness. It was uh, bipolar. 
extremely I difficult. I decided very difficult and very difficult in the Caribbean at that time when it wasn't spoken about. Who that crazy lady over there? <laughs> yeah. You know, and same then, here by the way. And then you find yeah. out that that's your mom, and you're yeah. just like, wait, did that Calypsonian just try to make a song about that crazy lady in the river? But that's my mom? Oh no! And I think immediately. Um, didn't have the education then enough to sort of uh, analyze what that was, but I knew that feeling uh, of activism um, mm. rose in me to make sure I became that person that spoke up for my, for my mom. Right. And so when I came to America, specifically to Brooklyn, you, you came here at 14. 14. Well, why'd you come here? How did that, how did that uh, work out? Well, uh, I am part of that um, Caribbean tradition of parents traveling to America and then sending for their children. Yes. In our case, um, my mom came first, and she didn't come out of need for a better life because, as I described to you, her, her dad was taking really good care of her and us um, and we were happy with what we had in our shop in our garden but she came because she was sick and Papa knew that she could get help in America so he sent her to America to get help but what she discovered was that as an immigrant with a very thick accent things get lost in translation so she didn't she wasn't given the respect or the patients needed to properly diagnose her. And my mom became, I want to say, a sort of test project. Um, she was given medication based on what her symptoms were that day, as opposed to somebody really digging into what the causes are, mm. where the depression was coming from, what makes her high, what makes her low. Um, and it took me naive but showing a lot of passion and love to really go into that system and say why don't we test other medicines on mommy because when I went to visit her after she took thoroughs in or whatever it is you gave her she didn't even know who I was within half an hour she was sleepy and would sleep for like a day oh my god something is just not right what an ordeal you're it a kid yeah, and I, you, you were know, how old? 14 I was or? 14, and then I did. I visited my mom in mental institutions, uh, the G building at Kings County Hospital specifically, pretty much almost every day for four years. All of high school. <laughs> um, in high school, yeah, there were moments of six months she'd be home, but then she'd be gone for a year in right. that hospital, right. and people, uh, like years later, they asked me to be a keynote speaker at a reunion for Erasmus and I finally broke down and said uh, I just want to explain to you why I ran from school every single day wow. why I never joined any club why everybody thought I was a selfish girl but smart it's because I had true responsibilities the you G sure building did. was calling me and you you're know? here in a foreign country yeah talk about that you're yeah. you're a, a kid again right yeah with a thick accent yeah and with a, a certain naivete about yes. the big city yeah right you don't know how to how to handle yourself what Did was that not. like were you confronted with with race issues um, and with you know all these other cultural race issues? and bullying yeah you know race race in that sort of prejudice way and then the bullying the way people just mentally uh bully you in school and the accent was really thick <laughs> Right. You don't even know um, the names of the streets just yet. No. And all this stuff is coming at you. It was terrible. And also I came in the winter with my with my sandals oh. and my little white lace dress because mama wanted me to look so good, but it wasn't right for the winter. <laughs> and then daddy, no, nothing against men because men make really good parents. But um, <laughs> at the go. time, my dad just didn't understand that, um, you know, in December, you probably need a heavier coat for mm. your daughter. So mm. I was freezing, mm. and you know that Pan Am jet was cold. That's a and tough start. That little taxi man that he had waiting for us to bring us to 836 Utica Avenue was just like I was freezing in the car. Oh. Um, it was just difficult. It was difficult. Right. But you know what? Every time I got to that place where I felt I couldn't cope anymore, that this is a lot. Why did they bring us here? I would just get on the phone and I would call mama and papa and they would just um, 
Say the things they've always said. Make the most out of where you are, child. <laughs> yeah, so. It'll be better. It will be better. Yes, it yeah. will. And yeah. so you go through high school, and somewhere along the line, you decide to become a journalist. Yes. Wh wh why? Well, that came early. That came why? in Grenada. Um, I didn't know what a journalist was, but I wanted to be the person whose name started with B-Y. <laughs> oh, on the byline, you mean? Yes. Really? Yes. So, so you I had to a see your name in the paper. Yes, I I, really? I had a little newspaper route, uh -huh. and I would get a red pen from my grandfather's shop, and I would sit under the coconut tree or a mango tree, whatever was in season, uh -huh. and I would edit all the papers before I delivered it to edit. my neighborhood. Edit, like really edit. Didn't know what edit meant, paper but I wasn't knew. edited already. Or? Well, I found little mistakes, ah. so I uh, typo. <laughs> little typos. Yeah. So I would fix that, and then, uh -huh. and then, like the next day or so. Um, the people would come to the shop and say to Papa, um, you need to tell your granddaughter that I want to read my paper without the red pen on it. <laughs> Papa would just laugh, like, what are you doing to the people's papers? You were you selling know? it marked yeah, up. Yeah, I would go, I'd give it to them after I edit, because it, like, a, a period would be missing True. or a comma or whatever. You're you are performing a service. Yeah, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that I wanted to be a journalist, but I was doing the things that was leading to that, and then sure. I started reading in the church. Basically, I just love words. I love books. My grandfather refused to buy a television. Never saw television until I went to Barbados for wow. our visa to come to America. And my wow. brother and I were like, oh my God, a smaller screen. Oh, because we <laughs> went to the movies before. Right. Like, oh my God. Wow. <laughs> and then we would go to the movies and we would look for mommy in the background of movies that we knew were filmed in New York. Wow would say, do you think mommy, I, I never knew that, you know, all these people in the background were planted. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess sometimes they just film, but yeah. I just thought mommy would be w walking across the Extras screen. Yeah, we were extra. like, oh, that's mommy, wow. you know. Yeah, but um, I knew I wanted to be a journalist. From a, from a young age. From so a then how do you get age. how do you get into it to start? You study. You no, study. No, how did you, how did you personally? Well, I. <laughs> I, I got an idea. <laughs> I have well, an I, idea. Went to, <laughs> I went to Erasmus Hall at high school, and I was determined to take um, English classes, and I, I wanted to take a, a type class, a typewritten class, and oh. I remember going and asking them to give me like a typing class, and they were like, why? And I said, because I want to be a journalist, and every time I see 60 Minutes, they're typing, they're typing so right. I think I have to type, you know, and they never gave me a typing class, so, wow. I, so I was terrible when I finally got my typewriter. I was just doing the one finger thing because that's what I saw. That's a real journalist, by the way. One finger. Yeah, exactly. That's old school. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then I, after Erasmus, I went to City College and I, I enrolled in their journalism classes. And someone suggested that I take a public relations class because mm -hmm. they said, um, if you're going to be a journalist, you're probably going to get, you, you have to come into contact with publicists at some day. I'm like, well, who are they and what do they do? <laughs> Imagine. Yeah, like, who are they? So I took a PR class, never intending to wow. use it, and uh, took history of journalism and print journalism mm -hmm. and uh, broadcast, and I did little documentaries. Uh, I did one called The Gentrification of Harlem. Wow. Um, and did all that stuff and was really ready to be a journalist, wrote for my for my church paper, mm -hmm. wrote just really um, went to, like, the the – journalism professors to ask about what they knew about internships mm -hmm. like is a village voice need somebody right. cbs need somebody like right. i was always interested i was just i that's what i wanted to do wow yeah and I so did. you did it i did you did do it i did i got hired i got hired at blackbeat magazine and i did that for about 10 years is that still around by the way uh only online that's what only I online yeah so yeah. the idea is to cover pop culture Pop culture. You didn't want to That's cover City I Hall? You didn't want to cover news? And I wanted to do news. I wanted to go to war. I wanted war. to go to war. I Vietnam? wanted to be... No, where are we No, this I wanted... Is, um, well, this would have been... When I first 80? came to this country, it was mm -hmm. Gerald Ford was coming in. So there was something wow. brewing, uh, and I wanted to go to the Middle East. I was like, I could be a journalist in the Middle East. Wow. And then the first real newsroom I went to there was like the ticker coming through and it was like a crime story, like someone had died and 
A bulletin. I was like, oh, oh, I don't want to do that. You didn't <laughs> like that? No, I don't want to. No, really? that's. I, I realized that I, I'm, 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 I'm a passionate person, but I'm an extremely sensitive person, and I was just like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do that. And I swear to you, probably the next day, I got a call from a friend of mine, uh, Robin Guilford. We went to City College together, uh -huh. and she said I work for this company called Sterling McFadden Magazines, and. They are acquiring Blackbeat, they're, they're acquiring Ride On magazine, mm -hmm. uh, but they have Blackbeat magazine. I said, I don't wanna work for Blackbeat, I'm gonna work for Ride On. <laughs> and she said, no, well, they're looking for an editor for Blackbeat. Wow. And I went in and I got hired on the spot and I was really upset with that because I said, sir, I stayed up all night. I put all my little writing samples together. You need to sit and look at my writing samples wow. and you need to give me an editing test. And he looked at me like, who are you? I told you you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> got the job. Uh, you got the job. What so are you, you arguing me about? So you're covering entertainment. Yes. You're covering pop culture. Pop culture. African-American pop culture. Yes. And yes. then you come in contact with Mariah Carey. I did. This is like the moment in your career. You don't even realize it. It changed everything and I it didn't did. even know it. Um, so, so what happened, I was sitting in my office the next day we would be shipping the book and I realized I have a page open, not a whole page, but um, like a half page that would be great for a review. So I'm like, oh, Mariah's album. I searched, 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 I don't have the album. The Advance is what we called it at that time. And so I called uh, Columbia Records, Larry Jenkins, uh, who I had known uh, from before and he had just left Capitol Records and went to Columbia and I said, I don't have Mariah's album and I have some space, I can listen today, I can review it and put it in. And he said, oh, we haven't sent it out yet. And I said, yes, you have. <laughs> yes, you have, Larry, come on, go check with your staff, you know? And he said, Yvette, you have so much passion in your voice, you sure you wanna keep writing for that magazine that's not paying you anything? You no. don't wanna be a publicist? I'm like, I don't wanna be a publicist. I wanna review Mariah Carey's album. You're being earnest and I, honest here. Yes, right. yes, and so, we hang up the phone, he calls me back, he said, I need you to come up to, to Columbia, I wanna talk to you. I said, do me a favor, send me the album, I'll listen to it, I'll do my review, and then I'll come up to see you. <laughs> and that's what he did. Really? And Columbia sent a car, I got in the car, I went up to see Larry, and Larry said, I've been doing this search for a publicist, and I've never thought that a music journalist would be the right move, but I think you're the right move. You're hired. I'm like, Larry, no, 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 no. I'm married. I have to talk to my husband. I, I, no, no, <laughs> I don't know. Not yet. Hold on. What do you think of <laughs> and, that? Um, you think that was for real? I, I thought he was joking with me, yeah. right? And then I, then I, I blurted out to him. I said, I don't want to be a publicist, truly. Every publicist I met, they're crazy. <laughs> they, they are on power trips. They invite you to stuff. You get there. They tell you the list is closed. I can't be that mean. I cannot do it. <laughs> That said, stuff's true, by the way. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed that, hopefully. Yes. And um, he said, uh, Yvette, the job is yours. And then I called David, my husband, and I said, Larry's crazy. He just hired me. He said, try it. If it doesn't work, so what? You'll get something else. Wow. And wow. even though I took the job, two things. Didn't know what I'd be working. Didn't know what Larry was paying me. <laughs> Got down to the building, to the... Um, Sony uh, lobby and the phone rang and the guard said Larry Jenkins is on the phone for you I said I just left him I said hey he said you didn't ask how much you gonna make you that didn't. must mean you really want this job I said oh my god wow I said okay well just tell me he said we're gonna start you out at 65,000 the phone Whoa. fell from me um, this was 1993 that's a lot of money I was making thirty-one thousand dollars at at Blackbeat magazine. Wow! I just got a double raise. You sure did. I, I but I'm trying to be cool. <laughs> I'm trying to be cool. Did you ask for more? No. You should have. You could no, have. No, I and I could have. How about have, eighty? And I didn't. Give right? me ninety. But then you know, Sony was very good to me. By the time yeah. I left Sony, I I had this. I had the kind of salary that made me made my Caribbean guilt resurface <laughs> you know what that is you were comfortable now yeah but I also felt that there were people right that I knew in right. my family that were not delivering babies yeah. and working hard and 
that weren't making that kind of money, and I felt guilty. People felt doing guilty, far guilty. more important stuff. Yeah, right? and I was like, I'm, I'm right. pitching people like what? Like my, my aunt is in the cold, right. like in the snow right. to go deliver a baby in Brooklyn. What am I doing? You know, so. Right. And then I got over it. You did? Yeah. Then I got over it because I was like, I work really hard. You do. Yeah. Jay-Z says, you know, how can I help the poor if I'm one of them? It's very true. That's pretty profound. It's very true. Right? There's a good it's reason very, to keep true. working hard right there. It's a, yeah. Well, it's been a good reason for me because I have I, I believe in giving back. And uh, right. Grenada is where I start with my charity. Right. And, um, you know, particularly with education, I really right. try to um, do a few scholarships for for the school here at Marisho. And um, in fact, I, I, I sort of owe uh, my next payment to them. I think it's really important that we give back. And the thing about it is that, you know, like colleges like TA Marisho in Grenada and any other college that comes under the University of the West Indies, it's really so not expensive compared to oh, no. what we pay for in America. But, but we digress here. Yeah, we let's, let's keep the climb going. Yes. All right, so you got Mariah. I got Mariah. You're you're seeing the world now. You're it's in Mariah. It's crazy Mariah's. that I got Mariah. Right. You're you're now the world has opened up to you. Yep. And you ju- w- must have blown your mind. Completely. So we we used to call it the Sony breakdown, uh, because after you get to the Sony Tower and you realize that you're on the 24 to 26th floor and literally you're on top of the world, right. then they add the biggest star <laughs> in the world on your plate and the pressure mounts, and uh, you're like, oh, it's okay, you're gonna go through the Sony breakdown and then you'll get over it. <laughs> well, what, is it what does that mean, pressure, when it comes to dealing with Mariah? You've well, got all these different things. Mariah, she has I mean, a lot she's of facets. still a big star, but right. in 93, when she was on her, I wanna say maybe third album, I mean, no one had seen or heard somebody like Mariah in ages. Everyone wants a piece of her. Yeah, yeah. And she has to deal with it emotionally. She has to deal with it emotionally. That voice was insane. Uh, the comparisons to uh, one of her idols and who became her friend, uh, Whitney Houston, was coming. So that was a lot of pressure. Um, no one was really talking about who is biracial and who's not. And she came out and said, I am biracial. And people were the black people were like, wait, what? And white people are like, what? You know, so that was a little bit of a pressure situation. Right. And then I'm going to Mr. Johnson at uh, Ebony and saying, I, I want you to put Mariah Carey on the cover. And he wants to put Mariah Carey on the cover. But he's like, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, so that's, a, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And her personal life. Right. And then her That's personal all life. over she's, the place. She, I mean, she's she's married to <laughs> she's married to the big boss at Sony. So right. never wants to write st- you know stories about yes, that. Yes, about that. And I'm I'm sort of serving two gods in a way because right. I want this young girl to um, to do really well and right. for the media to love her. Right. But I also want to please the big boss and make sure we're doing the right thing. And right. that was a lot. It was a lot. But um, but you grew. Oh, we, I grew, and I, I thank Mariah. I, I, I always say I cut my teeth, my publicity teeth on Mariah, because she really taught me um, to be a publicist. Yeah. She really taught me to be a publicist, because in a world for Mariah, in 1993 and beyond, where we could get everything and anything we wanted for her, at her young age, she exercised the art of pulling back. Mm. that we don't really have to do everything. That's interesting. That the performance, the voice was so important. Right. Let's really concentrate on those big performances. We did some really huge performances on television, right. and it just taught me how to be a strategist. Yeah, and that yeah. sounds very similar to what well, it prepared Beyonce me. It prepared today. me for all those years later, right? Right. To, uh, because today, Beyonce. To work with Beyonce. She's a woman of few words publicly. We don't hear much. Well, but when, when, when we do, you do, it's so it, good. It means everything, <laughs> it does, right? Yeah. As, and that's a strategy. Yeah. Clearly. It is a strategy. That's your, but I that's believe that. Um, I truly believe that Beyonce speaks very loudly in her art. Oh yeah. And um, I, I I believe that um, you know particularly w- with this current. Uh, album that is not necessarily a Beyonce album, it's various artists, but she produced it. Right. Um, 
the You're reaction, about Lion the Lion King, the right. gift, um, the reaction to young people around the world to some of those songs and particularly some of those lyrics that are so empowering. This is when I sit back and just smile and say, it's working. Like really, you've got this. You, yeah, it's like give, right. give, give people a chance to discover things at the same time um, and let them make up their minds whether it's relatable to them. Uh, that's an art, you know? And give her credit for deciding that Friday's a good day to put out albums. <laughs> <laughs> and to you not know? even say if they're doing a Destiny's Child. <laughs> no time Concert <laughs> tour in 2020. No, no, no one's saying soon. anything. What's mm. gonna happen is they're just gonna show up somewhere, no, no, do no. a pop-up, no. And just blow us, blow us up. No. No, we can't do that. No. Yeah, I no. Something so. like that, you know, that takes planning. You need big venues, you know. So that's going to take some time. And and let's not forget, you know, I mean, Matthew Knowles has to be, you know, he's still, like, he's Destiny's Child's manager. Right. He has to sort of go out there and get the venues and do all those stuff right. and coordinate all those get lady the venues. schedules. They'll just bend over. Everyone will... will clear their schedule oh, of course they yeah. will but you know people you know and i had to learn that uh venues uh no no one venue is for one thing right, right. so it's uh, is it the season for football is it the season for basketball can you get this and right. you know so it takes some time a lot of coordinating for right. tours yeah what's your biggest life lesson hmm. i think my biggest life lesson uh well maybe two or three if you yeah have to. there's a lot uh it, it came from something I said before, you know, and something that I fought early, you know, make the most of uh, where you are. Uh, and it doesn't mean sitting down and not striving to be better, but it means that if we all take care of where we are and do it well and everybody does it, the world becomes a different place. It becomes a different place. And it means like your, your children, your home life, all of that. I cannot do for any client if I don't first do for my personal life. Um, I have a life, my personal life, that is bigger, bigger than any stage I have ever been a publicist for bigger than any event I've ever done because it simply takes into mind who the real event is, the ha things that matter Have the most. you ever canceled a work thing Absolutely. for the family? Absolutely. Many times? Many times. Like turn down what seemed like a big opportunity because your child is sick or because your child needs you? Or Absolutely. This or and the, the incredible thing about having started my career with the artists that I've started my career with. Mariah was young, uh, her mom was very involved, Destiny's Child were young, parents were very involved. I started working with people who understood family, who understood the importance of family and the obligations to family. The ladies of Destiny's Child used to tease me all the time. They used to mount it to me at the end of a, a fashion shoot or an interview day. I would simply say to them, I'm going home to my babies. <laughs> so at the end, you know, when you're on a set and someone says rap, you would see Michelle, Kelly, and Beyonce all look at me and said, go home to your babies. <laughs> you know, because it, they, 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 they knew how important that was. Right. Um, you can't make up the time with your children. One time I was at Sony and I was in a meeting and the meeting kept going and going and going. I was like, oh my God, my daughter has a recital. She has a recital, I've got to go, I've got to go. And then when I finally got out of there, thank God for subways, I got on the subway straight to Greenwich Village. I walked in and she was just coming and I saw her do this. <sighs> yes, yes. Because she came yes. and she was like, Where, I see daddy. Uh, where's mommy? Right. Yeah, you can't make those You up. can't miss that. No, you can't miss that. Absolutely. Yeah. Family's too important. It's everything. Yeah. And you just have to be honest with the people that you work with. Yeah. They have to know who you are, what you're made of. And if they don't understand? I have to leave. Yeah. I have to leave. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that I've been around long enough to see 
the little girls grow up to be women and um, successful, wonderful women that want to make a difference in the world and now understand the whisper of I have to go home to my babies. And to think you had a part of that. I like that. Role. And it's a little role, but it was, uh, it was a good one. They showed me the world. Those four and then three black girls that turned into amazing black women gave me a ticket to see the world, to see culture, to taste different foods, to meet different people, to sit in the rooms with presidents and first ladies, to be a part of changing the narrative for young people and assured me a job for a very long time that afforded me the opportunity to take my own children around the world. Yeah. Now what could be better than that? What could be better than that? Yeah. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for you. For you coming you. in, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. I got to sit and talk to you. I, I you're an amazing journalist. Thank you. That's you too kind. are a fellow Caribbean national and you you really know your job. And uh, I am grateful that you have been a presence on the New York uh, news scene for quite some time. Too and long. No, time. not too long. Not too <laughs> long. Uh, yeah, representation you. matters. You can't be what you can't see. Mm. And there are lots of young Caribbean people that want to be because you are. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's true. Thank you. It's very true. Can't thank you enough. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. I think we can get you out of here on time. Yeah. Huh? I think so. Yeah. Right, like, right really? up against it. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. That time flew, man. That's